28. The Transformed Man In a culture burdened with sin and guilt, society and man are incapable of coping with their problems. Instead, they are busy adding to them by sadomasochistic actions. Such a society is capable of a parasitic advance by sadistic aggressions towards others and by expropriations of the achievements and wealth of other peoples. Finally, however, even this sadistic and parasitic progress breaks down in guilt and masochism. Dr. Woodward, recognising the nature of masochism from a non-Christian and humanistic perspective, has noted that, quote, guilt must be expiated, sin must be punished. Woodward hopes for a humanistic settlement of the problem of guilt and masochism, observing of a lesbian's conduct. Although I feel that homosexuality is an affliction, I believe a person should try to attain fulfilment on his or her own terms, instead of artificially trying to conform to the decrees of society. For Harrier, homosexuality seems to be the right answer, and now that she has freed herself from the masochistic guilt scarring that was a price for her fulfilment, she is perhaps closer to true happiness than most normal people. I would not want to meddle with her new equilibrium for the sake of bringing her into conformity with the normal world. The woman in question had only abandoned one form of masochistic self-atonement. We have no evidence that she abandoned self-punishment, nor is it possible that she did so. Woodward, who calls masochism and self-punishment the curse of Adam, tries to reduce God's moral law to the decrees of society, which is a falsification of the facts of the matter, the joyless and defeatist life which marks the masochistic personality is common to every culture and is never more in evidence than when men in societies have together abandoned moral law for permissiveness. The need for atonement is more than a cultural product. It is a part of the God-created nature of man and cannot be set aside. At the end of the Middle Ages, when faith had declined markedly, self-atonement proliferated. Many movements spread uncontrollably, satisfying the urge for self-atonement. The flagellants in the 13th century and later were a widespread and, in part, secret movement which hoped to save civilization by means of self-atonement. One flagellant hymn actually declared that Had it not been for our contrition, all Christendom had met perdition. By whipping themselves, the flagellants believed that they and civilization would be saved. The same attitude is present today. Sarah Winter, in a study of black and white students, concluded that Blacks and whites find it difficult to work together smoothly in businesses, universities or other organisations, even when they are nominally equal to seeking common goals. Sensitive Americans in this era can easily regard both blackness and whiteness as profoundly bad. To be nothing but black is to be lost within a group that has been castigated, oppressed, hated and maligned by the majority and powerless to act in its own defence. To be Nothing but white is to be the guilty agent of past injustices and present indignities. End quote. The author, as a humanist, is unwilling to push the conclusions, but she does recognise that, in their relationships, the blacks demonstrated aggressive potential in relation to whites, and the guilt driven whites expected the black males to dominate. The black behaviour can be recognised as sadistic. The guilt is laid on the white man and he is punished at every turn, whereas the white behaviour is masochistic, a readiness to be punished for supposed sins against the black man. In both cases, sin and guilt are intensified and the likelihood of any sound relationship is lessened. In neither case is a constructive plan of action possible with respect to the problems involved.
A sadomasochistic game of self-atonement is the essential and basic goal, not social progress. Scholars are aware of the fact of sadomasochism with its two dimensions of dominant submission and pain humiliation. The phenomenon is variously portrayed as associated with obsessive neurosis, manic depressive psychosis, paranoia, drug addiction, lack of achievement drive and political radicalism. In effect, any act or condition that is realistically opposed to the individual welfare may be perceived as masochism. Masochistic behaviours could include practically any psychopathological symptom or illness and any lifestyle that is not socially condoned. Because the problem is viewed humanistically, no solution is forthcoming. Because the moral law requiring atonement is seen as social bores and customs, the basic need is evaded. As a result, sin, the cause of guilt, cannot be dealt with. Thus, Dr. Gloria Cowan wants to establish a humanistic, psychological norm for sexual fidelity without making it a moral law. In discussing sex away from home, she insists that sex away from home has no special moral implication. In fact, clearly such behaviour doesn't have to be classified as pathological, for surely norms do exist precisely in support of sex away from home, particularly when peer comparisons are available. Thus, adultery is given a psychological justification and is separated from morality. Then, however, Dr. Cowan gives a psychological judgment against such adultery. Sex away from home can be seen as symptomatic of alienation from self and a splintered existence. It is just another form modern man produces, no more true to himself than the other indices of alienation and self-deception practiced daily. Sexual freedom from overburdened rules and guilts is a problem, but sexual freedom implies responsibility toward others and oneself, particularly toward oneself. Too often, sex away from home is sex away from self. What Dr. Cowan has done is to reinforce guilts and masochism. First, by denying morality, she has not eliminated it. The adulterer still knows he is an adulterer, violating God's moral law. Second, he now has an additional burden to carry because he is now a psychological criminal and failure. He has been branded with the word which reeks of humanism's original sin, alienation. He is alienated from others and from himself. If his adultery is especially joyless, it is humanism which has poisoned the cup. Adultery is now not only sinful, but it is also sick. It is almost enough to make sinful ascetics out of sinful men. As a result, in St. Paul's words, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, Romans 7.10. The purpose of the law is not to restrict man's life, but to fulfil it. When man disobeys that law, it becomes a death sentence to him. When he obeys it, it becomes life to him. By Christ's atonement, we are removed from self-atonement, from sin and death, and established in truth and life. There is a studied hopelessness about sadomasochistic activities and such actions preclude progress. The advances made to cite the black-white example are made in spite of the activities of politicians and sadomasochistic blacks and whites. Progress comes from individuals whose lives are productively free. St. Paul cites, as man's necessary response to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, a sacrifice of service in terms of renewed and God-directed life purpose. Way's translation of Romans 12, 1 and 2 is especially telling. I appeal to you then, by all these compassions of God, O my brothers, Bring your lives and set them by the altar as a sacrifice, a living one, a hallowed one, 
acceptable to God. The necessity of this rite of consecration follows from all the arguments. Do not conform to the externalities of this world. Nay, let your characters be transformed by the birth of a new life purpose, so that you may put God's design to the test of your own experience, and so prove how kind, how gladdening, how flawless it is. Lenski rendered Romans 12 to thus. And be not outwardly conformed to the world age, but be inwardly transformed by the renewing of the mind, so that you test out what the will of God is, the thing really good and well-pleasing and complete. The renewing of the mind is not only an act by God, regeneration, but a process, to cite Lenski's comment, wherein the regenerate man is in a process of renewal that advances steadily. The force of the word transformed was stressed by a great lay commentator of the early 19th century, Robert Haldane, 1764-1842. This word signifies the change of the appearance of one thing into that of another. It is used by the fabulous writers to signify the change or metempsychosis of animals into trees, or of men into the appearance of other animals. This term denotes the entire change that passes on a man when he becomes a Christian. He is as different from what he was before as one species of animal is from another. Let not men be so far the dupes of self-deception as to reckon themselves Christians while they are unchanged in heart and life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. If there be not a radical difference between their present state and that in which they were by nature, they have no title to the character of Christians. It shows that, in general, it is not difficult to discriminate Christians from the world. If the change be as great as the word of God here teaches, what difficulty can there be in most cases in judging of the character of those who profess Christianity? It is not the heart that we are called to judge. If the person be metamorphosed, as the word originally implies, from a state of nature to a conformity with Christ, it will certainly appear, and the state of the heart will be evident from the life. As there are degrees in this transformation, although all Christians are transformed when they are born again, yet they ought to be urged, as here, to a further degree of this transformation. Transformation means a new life purpose, an end to self-defeat, and a directed and purposive life of reconstruction under God. The demand for change comes from all quarters in a time of crisis. The new lefts of the 1960s and 1970s is most vocal in demanding change, but the essence of their position has been aptly described by Ayn Rand as an anti-industrial revolution towards pure destruction and anarchy. What are the activists after? Nothing. They are not pulled by a goal, but pushed by the panic of mindless terror. Hostility, hatred, destruction for the sake of destruction are their momentary forms of escape. They are a desperate herd looking for a furor. The characteristic of pseudo-masochism is rage and destruction, whether directed against others or against oneself. The characteristic of the regenerate or transformed person is freedom from this rage and destruction. The unregenerate mind is endlessly absorbed with evil and injustice. It can chronicle all the sins of others at great length and tally up the sorry tale of conspiracies against him. Action means destruction. The redeemed man is restored into dominion under God, first over himself and then over the world around him. He is transformed, metamorpho. This is the same word which in Matthew 17, 2 and Mark 9, 2 is translated as transfigured. Luke in 9, 28 avoids this term which might have suggested to Gentile readers the metamorphoses of heathen gods and uses the phrase. In Gennetto, 
heteron was altered, literally became genomai, difference, heterosis. In Romans 12, 2, it means, The obligation to undergo a complete change which, under the power of God, will find expression in character and conduct, morphe, lay stress on the inward change. The transformation begun in man is then developed in terms of the whole life of man, his family, vocation, society, state and all things else. He now has a life purpose which comes from God and his word and therefore the transformation of all things becomes a glorious hope for him in Christ. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17 declared, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The word new here is kainos, which does not mean new in time, but new as to form or quality of different nature from what is contrasted as old. Neos is new in the sense of being just born or recent. Kainos, as in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. It means a very ancient law, but one which is new and fresh in its meaning, coming anew to the hearer. Thus, the creation we are born again into by the grace of God in Christ is God's original creation, which we were once dead to, but are now made alive to by grace. It is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17, in terms of its quality and form, in that it is close to the hand of God and ever energised by his power. Thus, instead of a world of masochistic self-atonement and self-frustration, the believer moves in a world in which all things work together for good in God, Romans 8.28, and in which everything whether enmities, troubles, or death itself, further his fulfilment and bring him closer to the fullness of the new creation. In brief, man is transformed and, under God, he transforms the world. When St. John in Revelation 21.1 speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, the word used is again kainos. The new creation is as old as time itself in that it is God's original and constant purpose. It is the world of Christ and the transformed man come into its fullness, a world in which every experience and all life is forever fresh and new in quality. The first earth is gone, it passes away, literally goes away. Now man is born old in time and burdened with the sin of the past. He is born new in the sense of a recent birth but old in terms of being bound to the past of Adam's posterity. The transformed man moves towards a new creation in which he and the world around him are forever new in quality, joy and fulfilment. The old man cannot cope with crisis and history is one crisis after another. The unregenerate man either seeks escape from crisis by delaying or appeasing actions or resorts to a futile documentation of evil, hoping to save himself by his knowledge of evil. The transformed man, transformed by God, transforms his world and resolves the crisis.